Hello and welcome to Gardening with Native Wildflowers. This is a program presented by Loudoun County Public Library in collaboration with the wonderful people at the Loudoun Wildlife Conservancy. My name is Jeremy Worley and I work in the program department of LCPL and I'll be your host today. If you have any questions or, com or comments or questions, please feel free to use the chat box out of the bottom of the screen. Any questions will be asked at the end of the presentation, so feel free to use it. It's my pleasure now to introduce Virginia Master Naturalist Amy Mason tonight. She has a degree in environmental management and locally has done some amazing work using her knowledge of native wildlife to educate and improve our community. Thank you for being here tonight, Amy. Thank you for having me. All right, I guess let's get started. So, first, let me introduce myself. I mean, um, Jeremy did a good job already, but I just wanted to say this is who I am. I'm a mother of three. Uh, I also just recently opened up a, an indoor house plant shop called Foliage Plant Shop in Leesburg. Um, I'm a certified Virginia Master Naturalist, and I'm also vice president of the Banshee Reeks chapter of that. Um, I volunteer occasionally with Lab Wildlife Conservancy. I'm also a, an advisor for the Environmental Advisory Commission for the town of Leesburg, do environmental management. I'm a house plant collector and generally just a plant enthusiast. So today I'll be discussing the suburban garden and how you can improve yours in ways that will inspire others for future generations to positively impact our local habitat. In the United States, 40 million acres of land are now just lawns and habitat loss due to the suburban sprawl is the biggest threat to wildlife. We have taken away habitats and replaced most of it with impervious surfaces, lawns, and non-native ornamental plants. Uh, our natural places are corralled into designated areas with fragmented bits of land distributed between them. Um, we filled these other spaces with impervious surfaces and clear cut yards and without food and habitat, wildlife populations are disappearing. But we can change that. House by house, neighborhood by neighborhood, we can regrow these habitats. And I hope to teach you to recover the habitat loss, starting with your own home yard. So as you can see here, this is the American lawn, the crisscross mowings. Um, so basically, this is a food desert. There's nothing here for anything to eat. There's uh, few and far between any flower. A bee crossing this lawn would, by the time it gets to the other side, would be exhausted and most likely would probably not find any native plants to feed from. Um, same with the butterflies and other pollinators in our um, ecosystem here. Grass is also, for the most part, impervious. It, it you can see that the way it floods and puddles on top, it takes a while for it to sink in, meaning that it'll start to really wash away as it rains and pours, pouring all the uh, the fertilizers and herbicides out into the our other local areas as the rain washes through it. Also, we use gas powered mowers, and even if they're not gas powered, they're electric and they probably use fossil fuels in order to charge them. And um, and again, there's a lot of high nitrogen fertilizers that are, that are applied to lawns to keep them green and pretty and herbicides as well. And these are all washed into the, the waterways every time it rains. And this is also a monoculture. It's only one thing, one grass. This is most likely in most lawns, it's a non-native uh, ornamental grass that is designed and built to do well here, but Often in Virginia, they end, they end up turning brown by July or August. So it's not even really that optimal. We also use a lot of water, um, watering them um, and keeping them green and pretty when we have many other alternatives that can keep our, our front yards greener. So all in all, the lawn isn't great. It does not sequester carbon. It does not support a food web whatsoever, and it does not help us manage the watershed. But then there's also the non-native spring flowers. So, you know, as we get into spring, everybody gets very excited for all the, the tulips and the, the daffodils that 
pop up. Um, there's also the grape hyacinths, crocuses, snowdrops. They're all really pretty and exciting, but none of these are native. And these are all mostly bulb, bulb-like plants, and most of them are that are sold in stores. They're not native at all. Um, most bulbs are not. And um, yeah, they're all from other continents, and these were brought here and placed in yards and gardens by settlers in early America. In fact, the founding fathers were avid gardeners and really enjoyed the native plants that made this land so beautiful. They had magnificent gardens that represented the beauty and importance of plants and agriculture to the future society. But over time, it became a statement to show off our gardens by about the 19th century. It symbolized wealth and status, and the front yard evolved to become a material statement. Front yard horticulture, in turn, evolved to become an easy, highly accessible, cheap, and foreign thing to have. To have a tidy front yard that looks just like everyone else's meant that you're a good citizen who takes care of your property. But to have these exotic floral ensembles in your yard became commonplace, and it's so common that these have become the only flowers people really think to put in the garden. So on top of all of that, we've got, I'm just gonna call these bad trees. These, I'm just really advocating that people either stop planting these or help get rid of these. Um, now, when it comes to the autumn olive, it's, it's more of a shrub than a tree, but it can become a tree. Um, it is a very invasive, terrible plant that was brought here in about the, the mid 20th century. Um, it, it is a beautiful garden plant in a way. It's got foliage that stays up about 10 months of the year. Um, it's got beautiful flowers in the spring. It's got tasty and edible berries in the fall. Uh, the problem is that these berries lack any nutrients for the birds. Um, the flowers as well, not enough nutrients for the native um, pollinators. It also grows so fast and so thick that it it crowds out anything growing around it. And this is really dangerous for a lot of the, the fields and the and prairies that are now really going back to nature after being farms in some areas. If you drive down Evergreen Mills, you'll see autumn olive all over the side of the road. Um, it's really like decimating the the areas that aren't the thick forest. They can't really survive in a in a an established forest because of the the cover from the taller trees. But in an edge or field um, prairie meadow, autumn olive is really bad. Um, the the con the nutrient content of their berries are only have about one percent fat, I believe, and so that. Uh, it's not enough fuel for migrating birds or birds that overwinter to increase their fat stores. Um, it also is just so aggressive in the way that it grows. The, the tap root goes down really far. And so if you just try to pull up a young sapling, it, it won't let you. It's very aggressive. Now, the Bradford pear, this was invented by a Montgomery County, Maryland horticulturist. This stands out to me because I'm from Montgomery County. Um, he wanted, he sought to develop the perfect tree, the front yard tree, the, the tree that lines main streets, and he invented a monster, in my opinion. Um, the flowers are very heavy with pollen, um, adding to our already heavy pollinated air in springtime, but also these are very invasive. They spread quickly. They have, uh, they spread through uh, their tap roots, through rhizomes. They, they really encroach territories. Um, the berries are, or the, the tiny little pears are spread, they reseed, and then they spread as well. And we have problems with huge thick forests of Bradford pears and nothing really feeds off of them um, other than the birds that have eaten them. It doesn't mean that it fueled them enough um, and they're really a, a threat to our native spaces. But it is also a very common front yard tree in Loudoun County, Northern Virginia, really everywhere in the East Coast. It's a very popular one. Um, then there's the crepe myrtle. Now this one isn't as um, 
invasive in the way that it spreads rapidly or anything. It's just that this is the main tree of the south and that it's the one that everybody wants to have in their front yard. The beautiful flowers that are showy, they they're, they bloom for about three or four months. They have really showy bark in the winter, but they lack any nutrient content for any wildlife in our area. Um, I am a, an advocate that people cut down their crepe myrtles and replant good native trees in their place. For example, the oak tree provides food, fuel, habitat for well over 500, 600 different species, and that includes different lepidoptera, butterflies, bees, squirrels, um, every little element of our food web in our in our ecosystem, the oak tree can support just about all of it in some way or another. Whereas the crepe myrtle, nothing feeds from it. Birds don't nest in it. Bees don't really go to the flowers. It's 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 not really helping our ecosystem. All right, so I I guess I messed this this one up. So I wanted to um, guess explain. Oh man, the pictures really got messed up here. So there was a picture. The tulips were over here. Uh, sorry about that. I wanted to show how uh, what alternatives you can plant for the non-native typical plants you see in a front yard. Um, so instead of the tulips that were supposed to be over here, they're behind that picture. Um, the the one thing that comes to mind for me is is the Virginia bluebells. It's a great replacement for it because it gives you that same wow factor when you start seeing the tulips coming up out of the garden. Um, when you start seeing the little bit of bluebell blossoms in the ground and their spinach-like leaves, it's just even more exciting than tulips. Um, but then again, there are several other plants that I can think of, including Dutchman's Britches. We've got uh, Cutleaf Toothwort, um, Spring Beauties, and Trillium. These are all really wonderful alternatives to tulips. Uh, you don't need the tulips. If, if you still have them, though, it's no big deal, but just please try to start planting more native plants. Any any time you have a non-native ornamental plant in your yard, it can seriously affect our, our community, our ecosystem, our habitat in our area. Um, not that that one tulip is going to negatively affect everything, it's just that instead of that, it could be any other one of these plants and it can provide a host of so many different benefits for our ecosystem, whether it is cover, whether it is um, nectar source, it is the seeds, it is the fruit. Um, even in, um, for example, for Trillium, this uh, this one right here is the Trillium, I believe. Uh, just call it the yellow toadstool. toadstool. Um, it it is the host plant for these click beetles that ho that have little parties in the in the flower area right in here, and um, they need these Trillium flowers in order to have these little parties. And in these parties, they're able to get their reproductive jobs done and um and and go on with their life after reproducing and meanwhile as they're doing that they're pollinating these flowers and the trillium will be able to root a seed and move on for the next year oh and there's also phlox phlox is a really good replacement for tulips because tulips are often planted in full sun and creeping phlox is a good full sun one Whereas these other ones, they um, they can tolerate some dappled sun, but in their natural habitat, they're growing under the trees, but they are done with their reproductive cycle and they go dormant before the leaves have fully leafed out. So it's sort of, it can easily be a, a great, all of those can be great plants for replacing tulips. All right, so then when it comes to honeysuckle, um, we do have a native alternative to honeysuckle. The Japanese honeysuckle is a very fragrant, beautiful, and tasty plant. Um, if anybody grew up eating the nectar off of Japanese honeysuckle, you understand. Um, but it is very invasive. It 
stays green all winter long as it continues to choke and encroach on all sorts of other native plants. And while you may think that it's kept tidy and stayed in your yard on that one fence for so long, it could, there, you know, you've controlled it. You don't realize that the birds eat the berries that these fruit with in the fall and then dispense the, the seeds elsewhere and it will continue to grow in other natural areas and, and cause harm to other things. Um, so if you have that, it would be wonderful if you could take the Japanese honeysuckle out and put in the coral honeysuckle, the Lunacerus sempervirens. The, um, the flowers are spectacular. The growth is really pretty. Um, the hummingbirds love these flowers. They're, they're amazing. Um, I have some growing in my backyard and my neighbor behind me said that she saw hummingbirds for the first time in her life, in her adult life, just from my yard and they're feeding off of my coral honeysuckle. So it was a pretty special moment. And another comparison of native versus non-native, we've got milkweeds versus the butterfly bush. I always sort of mentally um, associate these because butterfly weed is a great alternative to the butterfly bush. Butterfly bush is an Asian ornamental plant that was uh, brought here because the, the flowers are so showy and it's very pretty, but it is not helpful for our pollinators, for our butterflies. In fact, it's um, compared to uh, chocolate for humans. Uh, it doesn't provide any any fuel for the butterflies. It is mostly sugar, no fat and protein. It is it it's not going to be what the butterflies need in order to finish their reproductive process or to migrate. You may see a lot of butterflies all over the butterfly bush, but it's not it's not doing any good for them. It's not giving them the um, the natural chemicals that will help the butterflies um, sort of stay. Uh, I guess what I'm trying to say is it, there are certain plants that make them a little more toxic for other predators to eat. So, like, for example, the monarch butterfly, um, the caterpillars eat the milkweed and the caterpillars, while the milkweed is very toxic, the caterpillars become this toxic creature for something else to eat. And because of that taste and their colors and their stripes and then the butterfly, the coloring on that, it really warns predators that, that it's not going to be a yummy meal. So if a monarch butterfly is flying around and only has the butterfly bush to eat from, it's diminishing that toxicity in them and it's also not giving them the right fuel they need. Now, butterfly weed and common milkweed, swamp milkweed, these are our three milkweeds that are native to Northern Virginia. And they're, they're the only plant that the monarch butterfly can lay its, its eggs on. Um, now, if you're removing butterfly bush and trying to replace it with something, um, the, the common milkweed can be perfect. It's like a, a very thick, wonderful plant, but it's not as showy as butterfly weed to me. Um, I like how thin the, the leaves are and how tidy the plant can be, but um, it certainly doesn't get as big as a butterfly bush. None of these really do. Um, and that can be a bonus for some. But the butterfly bush really becomes like a, a true shrub and large shrub after some time. But there's plenty of other plants that you can plant in, the, in its place. Now, another native versus non-native uh, example is the heavenly bamboo nandinas. Oh, no. I'm sorry, I have a typo right there. That is not heavenly bamboo right here. I meant to write in that it, this is American beauty berry. Um, so Nandina is very common in our suburban landscape. Um, it has berries in the winter. It has this really pretty foliage in the in the fall and the winter, but the berries are actually toxic to birds. And unlike other ones where the, the birds eat the berries and and it just doesn't do enough for them. This is actually toxic for our native birds. Um, you see this really almost in every commercial parking lot. You see it in front of schools. You see it really everywhere. And of course, in suburban neighborhoods, it is very important that we stop planting Nandina. 
In its place, you could do the winterberry holly and you could do the American beautyberry. The American beautyberry has these beautiful purple berries and um, it does lose its leaves, but the winterberry holly does not. Um, oh no, the winterberry holly does lose its leaves, but it doesn't lose the berries in the in the winter. And that can really create a really beautiful winter interest. And these are also a great alternative to the Nandina, but also to boxwoods. I felt like these were a better comparison though, because the azaleas, laurels, and hollies don't, uh, the inkberry holly does not lose its leaves in the winter. So they're a good winter um, plant evergreen. The boxwood is, it's time for it to go to. The only um, insects I've really seen around them are the leaf miners and the boxwood mites, which are really just causing harm to the boxwoods can um, damage them and it gets really ugly in the, I'd say late spring. They're just, they're, there's no benefit to the boxwood except to please aesthetically. You can trim them to be all tidy and pretty, but really what's the point of them when you can be providing um, habitat, food, protection, and all sorts of other things with azaleas, hollies, and mountain laurels. And these all have beautiful flowers as well. And the boxwood doesn't really. Um, also, there's hydrangeas. Now, I do love a good hydrangea of any sort of color, um, but the oak leaf hydrangea really, it, it, it's above all of them. It's not only native, its leaves are beautiful in the shape of oak leaves, and the flowers are incredible, and they bloom just about as long as any other hydrangeas. They also provide so much food and fuel for so many different types of pollinators. Um, if you just sit and watch an oak leaf hydrangea get its visitors and pollinators, you'll be amazed with how important this hydrangea seems to be to these pollinators. And you can also find these oak leaf hydrangeas in the mountains while hiking and such, and it's it's really spectacular to find. So I also wanted to go over common weeds that are actually native in our lawns and Home gardens, uh, people are constantly pulling violets, the chervil, the sedges. The sedges are usually people's worst enemy in the grass, but they're actually a really beautiful um, grass alternative. They uh, provide seeds that are food for birds. Um, there's also the chervil, which is actually the, the OG black swallowtail butterfly host plant. This and golden alexander, um, they are native. They, you know, are the host plant for the black swallowtail butterfly, and the black swallowtail butterfly will pupate through the winter under chervil and, and golden alexander, and then the next year, when it uh, emerges in the spring as a butterfly, it's got the flowers from the chervil and other native plants with flowers blooming all around it, and it is really important for the um, chervil to, to be around and not to be pulled from your garden. And then there's also, um, back to the violets, they are um, really important for so many different types of wildlife. Um, turtles eat from them, butterflies and bees um, eat from the nectar. Um, they're just so important. And they can be a really great ground cover and alternative to, to grass if you have a healthy mix of violets and in with grass if you want, um, as well as um, sedge in there and some, some clover. It's, it's going to be a really healthy and productive lawn. Um, and what's great is violets, they bloom twice a year. They, they go off of how much time of light they have instead of by temperature and all that. So you might have a lot of blooms in the spring and then also have them again in October. There's also star chickweed. So often we see this common chickweed um, in suburban gardens. This one is right up against my compost bin at home. Um, this is very annoying for a home gardener when you're pulling weeds in the spring out of your raised bed, you're always pulling chickweed, um, but it's actually kind of a fun one to pull. It is not native, but the star chickweed, Stellaria pubera is, is native and it is so, so interesting to see blooming in the spring. 
as you can see, the flower is so much bigger than the flower on the left, the common chickweed stellar media. Um, the leaves, the flowers, the, the seeds, everything about it is a little bit bigger and it makes it really stand out as a floor cover in the forest. Um, I wish I had these growing as a weed in my garden, um, but it's really just the common chickweed. Common chickweed was brought here by early settlers to be food for their chickens, and it's also parts of it are edible. And um, um, unfortunately, it's an annoying nuisance in the garden. But birds do feed off of the star chickweed, the native one. They uh, grow these grow in moist rocky woodlands. They're pollinated by bees and flies. And then, yes, their seeds are eaten by birds. It's good fuel for them. Um, and my formatting really messed me up on this. So I will just have to fill in these black blanks. <laughs> um, so the flower here on the left, actually, let me just start with saying that these are all flowers grown in my garden, and these are all native plants. We've got foam flower here. It's similar to coral bells in the way that the flower, I mean, the leaves look. Um, the flowers are a bit different than coral bells, but I just find them to be one of the most standout plants in my front yard garden. Um, they do like some more shady areas. Uh, it's right up against my north facing front yard, um, right against the house. It provides very important nectar sources for different types of tiny flies and tiny bees, um, as well as butterflies. Then there's the um, the woodland flocks right here in the, the upper middle. This is a very fun one to see once a lot of the spring ephemerals have died back in the spring. This is more of a late spring emerger. Um, the end of April, it starts popping out and it's got these beautiful colors through the forest. You just see them popping out behind trees and um, they're very important for different types of bees in the in the forest. And then over here on the right, we've got green and gold. Um, the, um, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> green and gold is a great ground cover, but not in the way that I would walk through it really, but it's a low growing, matting, beautiful swath of green with these beautiful flowers growing, popping out of it. And it has a very long bloom time. I'd say it starts blooming uh, early, earlier mid-April through August, maybe even September, if you're giving it enough um, water through the hotter months. Then we've got um, the Virginia blue iris and um, the, the Virginia blue iris is the one native iris in our area. Um, it's gorgeous. It's got um, it's very important for butterflies and hummingbirds. It's now in my front yard garden as well. It tolerates the soil, the sun, the heat, the the cold in the the how strange our Aprils can be. And then at the bottom right, we've got um, the columbine. And the column, the wild columbine is spectacular. It's like this upside down star. Um, like a, it's it's very similar to the shooting star, but it's a bit different. And it's it's leaves stay up all summer, but the flower uh, it blooms in April May. Another great garden flower that is native is the rue anemone. This one has a long bloom time, May uh, March through June. It's very dainty and pretty, um, but it. It, you can have swaths of it and they just look so beautiful. Their, their name comes, uh, it's a Latin root from the god of wind because these will keep blowing in the wind even when there's no wind blowing. They're just always fluttering and they're very important for butterflies and bees and they have a great bloom time and they work great in the garden. Other ones you may find in your garden already or that can work great in your garden are plant, plantain leaf pussy toes, which is antenaria, antenaria. Um, I'll leave that be. <laughs> so this is the host plant for the painted lady butterflies. It is also a great nectar source for many types of butterflies. Um, it's got evergreen leaves all year. So you'll see these leaves sort of in mats in 
in the forest and at your home garden in the uh, in the rocky areas. If you have a, a shady garden, you'll probably still find these too. Both of these types of plants, saxifrage and um, antonaria, are um, they grow in the same conditions. You might find them nearby each other. And they work great as easygoing garden plants that can kind of take a lot. Um, they, uh, the early saxifrage, it um, has buzzier stems. And there's some fuzziness to the plantain leaf pussy toes, but the saxifrage sort of deters ants and small ground um, insects from going up to the flowers and they encourage butterflies and bees to pollinate from them. And since the flowers are so tiny, they they pretty much encourage just the tiniest of all um, bees and flies. And they're um, also the host plant for the great spangled fertility. And the leaves for both types of plants are really pretty throughout the, the winter and can also be a good ground cover. And these are the leaves of the sex bridge in December. Wild geranium is a really good garden plant. It can grow under many conditions um, and I highly advise it. It attracts a wide variety of spring pollinators. Uh, the leaves stay up and green for most of the, the warm season. Um, they do like some well draining floodplains and that can sort of mean a good lush front yard or backyard. And yes, Native Americans used it medicinally, historically. There's also trout lilies. Trout lilies are an excellent ground cover if you have a more moist backyard, maybe if you're near um, some forests or streams. Um, I love the way that the leaves pop up and they look like they look like trout. They're, um, the spottedness of them and the, the shape of the foliage is just gorgeous. Uh, one tip and trick about trout lilies is that if only one leaf comes up, then it won't flower this year. But if two leaves come up, then it will. And they're seen in yellow or in orange, I mean, or white. <laughs> um, and these pictures were taken at Balls Bluff Regional Park. And you'll see just huge patches of these throughout the riverbanks of, of different areas around Northern Virginia and Maryland. They form colonies and then they're just gone once they're done with their reproductive um, habits. And they're replaced by other sort of forest ground cover. Um, and it's just miraculous how you see these just covering huge areas and then they're just gone. And that can lead way to other types of plants that you want to plant that come out more in the summer, like scarlet bee balm or um, uh, Miss Manners obedient plant, maybe, or maybe, maybe not that one. It kind of crouches out the ground, but um, you can. The point I'm trying to make is that you can plant these first, and then have um, the the summer plants replace it as the the year goes on. So Virginia bluebells. These can be a very good garden plant. Um, they do prefer to grow along floodplains. If you have a wet backyard, this is great for them. They don't want to be in full sun, though. Um, they will emerge in March. These days, this this year, it's been probably about two weeks ago. You can really start seeing them. But um, normal years, they start emerging in early March and start really being in full bloom by first week of April. And you see them in, in bright blue. They also start out pink and then turn blue, but some of them are pink and some of them are also white, which is pretty rare. I saw my first white ones last year at Walsh Bluff Regional Park. And oh, and I put in there that it should be the state flower. It should. Um, I'm an advocate that the flowering dog would um, be replaced by Virginia bluebells because um, North Carolina has the flowering dogwood as their flower, state flower. So I think we should take the Virginia bluebells. <laughs> The dwarf larkspur is a gorgeous, amazing garden plant that is native. It has these trumpet-like flowers that are perfect for hummingbirds and, and lepidoptera, butterflies. Um, they grow great along trillium. I always find them growing around trillium at um, Falls Bluff and at um, Banshee Reeks Nature Preserve. 
in this picture here, you see that they turn this beautiful pink once they're done um, blooming. Um, their leaves remind me of geranium. They have um, this sort of palmate look to them. Their leaves are really pretty. You can start seeing them grow um, far before they start blooming. And um, they just look great speckled among different trillium in the wild. They are toxic to most mammals, so you won't find um, deer eating them. And um, it's just a, a gorgeous, attractive garden plant. They are related to foxgloves. So we're going to get into the, the dangers of non-native ornamental plants. So, oh, I'm sorry. Um, so non-native ornamental plants like, um, sorry, like like tulips, um, crocuses. Um, I don't know Japanese. Um, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on the name of the one that's like ivy. Um, English ivy, that's a really good one. These all have no specialists going towards them. And because there's nothing feeding off of them, nothing benefiting from them, this will decrease insect populations in the local area, It'll, which will in turn decrease bird populations, which will decrease overall biodiversity in the area. Um, Non-native ornamental plants can also bring diseases with them and also non-native pests, like for example, the boxwood mite on the boxwood, they came together. And um, now we have a pest like that over here. Um, another great example of um, diseases and pests that came from other places is like when we got the Japanese chestnut tree in the United States, this ended up causing widespread uh, chestnut tree diseases onto the American chestnut. And it wiped out the entire population of chestnut trees in about 40 years. And it was very fast. It came with this um, um, this one type of pest that I'm blanking on right now. Um, and this is just another example as to why non-native plants just shouldn't be here. They cause a lot of issues. They can um, decimate entire populations. And the, chest, the American chestnut was the largest nut-bearing um, tree in the eastern United States. And without these amazing food sources of chestnuts, um, a lot of our wildlife have been affected by it. There, that, that chestnut was a lot of fuel, a lot of food, and, and you know, really affects the entire food web when this is lacking. Now, instead, we've got the tulip poplar and oak trees to replace them, but they're still not quite the, the fuel that the wildlife um, could really live off of. So, getting back to gardening, this is a screenshot on the left of my house when I first got it. Um, this is taken by like the Google Street Map car, and I just I. I wanted to show you just how it looked like right before we bought the house. Now, this is just a townhouse community in Leesburg. Um, you know, you get what you can get around here. <laughs> and um, in the front, we had this plum tree that was actually just about to be infected with a um, black knot fungus that ended up killing all the plum trees in the neighborhood. And there was only grass in our front yard, and we had a few shrubs in the in the very front right here by the windows. Now, fast forward to about six years later, I was able to replace some of the shrubs, and unfortunately, there um, I replaced them with hydrangeas that are not native. I did not know at the time, but now they're really huge and hard for me to replace. I did get rid of this boxwood that's down here in the bottom left of the new picture. Um, we replaced the plum tree with an eastern redbud tree, and I started a garden right here where my dog is behind this tree, and that was my big project over COVID to sort of turn this, this sort of portion of the yard into something else. I also was able to add in another bed over here. I did that one first, actually, but at first I had done all non-native, just ornamental plants. I went to Home Depot. This is before I really understood how important native plants were. I had um, I had daylilies in there. I had um, the non-native salvia sage, 
Um, I had uh, a, a ton of them. I had um, another shrub that I can't think of the name of. And since then, I have replaced most of it with with um, native plants. So in that area here that I'm talking about, I had Japanese pieris. That's the one I was thinking of. I had dwarf mini hostas, um, the sage plants, daylilies. I did have on this end the flocks that I have moved around the yard. I, I move it almost every year. And <laughs> then um, I did add some succulents on the side just to fill out all these blank areas. And um, I have a step over rocks so that I can go to my neighbor's house whenever I want. But then, so that was in 2019, 2020, I decided to take out the daylilies and I put in the Liatris um, um, flower that is just so beautiful and native and amazing. And um, then I also added in irises. I have um, uh, blue eye grass in the middle of it. You can't really see. And this is uh, the picture on the right is just after the flocks had stopped blooming. I've um, also got a lot of scarlet bee balm growing back there. And then at the uh, right as you step down from the stairs, there's um, butterfly weed, Asclepias tuberosa. So this is just sort of the progress I wanted to um, show off is that over here, I bought all these plants at um, most of these plants from Watermark Woods, a native plant nursery. I added in some comb flowers that I um, had transplanted from the backyard that I wanted out of my vegetable bed. And I added every year I grow a few zinnias because they're pretty, but I make sure that I have plenty of other plants for the native wildlife. I've got Coreopsis, Miss Manor's obedient plant, which really ended up taking over by the third picture on the right. Um, you can see the, the tick seed Coreopsis is the white, I mean, the yellow flowers right here, but then this green leafy vegetation right here is the start of Miss Manor's obedient plant. You have to be a little bit careful whenever you're planting Miss Manor's obedient plant because it is a little bit aggressive. Um, but it can be pulled easily and um, and moved around. I've also got a small um, sweet spire shrub right there. I've got um, a, a bee balm that is the purple bee balm. You can't really see it well. It's somewhere in here. And either way, I wanted to show you that this is how it looked when I first put it in, and then this is the second year, and then by the third year it really started popping out and it, it gets gorgeous. And this bush here over by my car looks like this in the fall and it is gorgeous. This is the um, aster and it starts blooming in September and for about two months, it is just so gorgeous. And it's a very popular plant for the bees in late fall. This is Miss Manor's obedient plant over here on the left and um, to me, it's just, it's just so pretty. The bees love it. The birds, um, feed off the seeds and butterflies frequent it. It's a gorgeous plant. And there's my pup sitting in front of our newly established garden when we first planted it in 2020. So I wanted to introduce you to some grasses and sedges that are native. Um, in case anybody wanted to screenshot this, um, I got this from the audubonvirginia.org site um there's a number of them that are great for warm season or cool season um i i highly advise you planting some of these these are great food for birds and and other critters throughout the 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 end of the year as they as they seed they're just wonderful replacements for all of the non-native grasses that are growing everywhere So back to um, the threats to native plants, it's really the invasive plants, the non-native ornamentals. Um, a lot of these invasive plants have allelopathic effects, which means that they will uh, produce a toxin within the soil that will inhibit any other plants from growing around it. And a lot of the time, these plants are the native plants that are not used to these types of chemicals. And so they will be less uh, likely to grow the next year after Feeling all that toxicity. Um, a huge, the, the biggest threat to native plants really is habitat loss. 
every time we clear a forest or a field and put in houses, and then we just put down these green blocks of lawn and then a few crepe myrtles, we now have a desert. There's nothing there for any critter to go back to. Anything that emerges um, in the spring from the soil is not going to really uh, be able to find any food there. Um, trampling by humans can be a big threat to native plants. If you're going for hikes, we, uh, you know, really, it'd be great if you step, stayed on the trail. Um, you never know what you could step on when you go off trail. There's young seedlings, there's rare plants, there's things that are just trying to survive. And by trampling by humans, it is um, going to be affected. And then because of our heightened deer populations, um, they overgraze and they can decimate native plants because they actually have evolved with the native plants, so they will seek them out. Deer can eat a lot of things, but they love all of the things that they've been loving for hundreds and hundreds of years, thousands of years. So they are going to go for the things that they've evolved to eat and those things have been growing here naturally. So that means less native plants for, that are gonna be growing because of our overpopulation of deer, overgrazing. So yes, native plants, I mean, invasive plants are not native. <laughs> they grow fast, they spread rapidly, they crowd out native plants and take over large areas quickly. Here on the left, you see um, garlic mustard, which is a huge problem. It's got a lot of uh, allelopathic toxins that um, deem the soil basically ungrowable for native plants. We've also got um, ground ivy next to it. Um, that's a very annoying one that I could not get rid of at my old work garden. And, um, and then in the middle here, you see honeysuckle all over everything. And then in the background, you see a light sage color that is autumn olive. Honeysuckle is awful. Um, the one plus about it is that in this in the winter, it is still green. So you know you're definitely cutting honeysuckle when you're trying to cut invasive plants, but um, otherwise it is a terrible plant. It overtakes everything. And um, this picture was taken alongside a trail at Banshee Reefs Nature Preserve that is just completely covered in invasive plants. And, and there's nothing native that really grows on that section there because of those. On the very right, we've got um, um, pennywort and, and honeysuckle seedlings and, and just um, the ground ivy also. It's uh, pretty bad <laughs> when there's invasives that cover everything. So introduced plants, AKA non-native ornamental plants, they are bad at supporting insects, insectivores, specialist pollinators, complex food webs, stable food webs, and they're just bad at supporting ecosystem function all in all. An ecosystem cannot thrive when all of the plants are taken out. Plants are the groundwork, the, the, the groundwork for really all life and without the insects that feed from the plants and then the other insects or birds or critters that feed off of these specialist bugs, if they can't eat those, then entire ecosystems can be swiped clean. Um, it's, it's, it's a pretty sad time for our, our uh, ecosystem here in Northern Virginia or the whole really east coast um, lawns and home gardens are really where we need to concentrate our efforts. It's not going to be just going out to the nature preserves and the, and the other places and, and removing the invasive plants. It's also getting back to our home ecosystems, our home habitats, and making them habitats again for native wildlife. Our Non-native ornamentals aren't doing any good for the ecosystem. They're they're only only doing bad. <laughs> um, so I encourage you to please come out to the spring native plant sale that's Saturday, April twenty second, hosted by Lab Wildlife Conservancy. There will be four um, native plant vendors there, as well as a couple other tables that will help um, you understand. Or there will be a volunteer opportunities at some of these tables for you to uh, learn more and, and do more for the environment.
So at this plant sale, um, I encourage you to get every kind of uh, native plant for your garden. It's um, it's my second favorite weekend of April. First is the Leesburg Flower and Garden Festival, and I will be there too um, at the Flower and Garden Festival, hosting my own booth at the festival for my foliage plant shop. And um, that's pretty much it. I wanted to leave a little time for questions if anybody has any. Yeah, so we have a couple questions. Um, pardon my pronunciation on some of these flowers. Um, the first question was, aren't the crocus carolinaris native to our, this region? I would have to look that up because I was, um, I thought I had learned that there was not any native to Virginia. Um, I guess there is some um, indigenous to the southeastern United States um, I'd have to look into that. I don't think it's the ones you typically see in your yard, though. Yeah, there's a Carolinus. It's possible. Okay. Um, <laughs> second question. Do you consider Campsis radicans invasive? Oh, the trumpet vine. So that's a there's a bit of a misnomer with the word invasive because there can be native invasives. Um, the trumpet vine is native and it's a very wonderful plant as long as it's in a controlled area. It can totally overtake um, a backyard. It can overtake fences and walls. Um, when it climbs up trees, though, it is not a problem for the tree. Um, native vining plants don't typically try to kill the tree that they're running up, like um, like wild grape and coral honeysuckle and things like that. They want to just sort of utilize the tree to get to the sunlight, but they don't want to kill it. So um, unless you're dealing with trumpet vine in your home yard and your yard is small, I would not um, advocate for taking it out. Um, another question, are there any resources for IDEAN sedges for Fairfax or Loudoun County? Um, I did find at AudubonVA.org that there was a lot of information on grasses and sedges. Um, but grasses and sedges will fool and um, confuse most botanists. They're just, there's so many. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's vast. All right. Um, and then we had a couple questions on the, the one slide that had uh, formatting issues. A lot of people had questions about the name of the flower in the top right corner, the one that had yellow flowers. I don't know if we can scroll back to it. Gold. Yeah, I'm yeah, sorry. So that, that, the one, yeah. So the top right one. Yeah, that's that's called green and gold. Um, I forget the ex I can look up the um, the Latin name. But the common name is green and gold, and it's um oh yeah, Chrysogonum virginianum. It's um yeah, it's 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 in the aster family, the greater aster family, but it's um native to the whole east coast. Okay. And, yeah. and then um another question: what about chestnut oak? Is it a good alternative to the American chestnut, which has been decimated by disease? Yeah, really any oak tree that is native to the United States, including chestnut oak, are a really great alternative to almost any tree. Oaks okay. provide so much food and fuel for so many different types of wildlife. Um, a question, do you support chemical treatment on non-native plants to get rid of them, I guess? Um, it, it's difficult to feel supportive of it, but sometimes it is the only thing necessary besides um, I, I'm more pro um, planned burns because it's less toxic, but um, that's not most of the time a thing that's allowed. So um, sometimes you do have to use it. And if that's the one thing that helps get rid of a lot of uh, really bad native, I mean, invasive plants that are non-native, um, I some it depends on how close it is to a waterway or something, but um, the there's been studies that show that the bacteria in the soil can eventually help get away the glycophosphate and um, other chemicals that are in that. So you just sort of have to hope that it's it's worth the benefit for that risk. 
Um, a question is creeping Jenny native. It's it spreads rapidly. I found it in just the middle of the forest near no other creeping Jenny and it obviously is because the birds had probably spread its seed. Um, it's not native. Okay, um, we had a question. I'm looking for a low height ground for low height ground cover plants that are not aggressive spreaders to put in a dry shady area under a tree. I want to replace the shredded mulch wasteland. Any ideas for that? Oh, the, um. The green and gold on the top right is a really good one for that. It only gets about this tall, maybe 12 to 18 inches, maybe. Um, I think it would look so great under a tree, like in, you know, it's surrounding underneath it. There's also um, wild ginger, but that does like to have some shade, but the, it stays green for most of the summer. Um, it, it likes to have a little bit wetter areas, though. Um, there's foam flower, the, the like in this top left picture, the the flowers stop blooming uh, around May, but the the leaves are gorgeous and they could look great in a in a crowd around a tree too, and they stay pretty low. Looks like we have maybe two more questions. Um, a, a person said, "I live in an HOA. I'm ripping out all the non-native invasive bushes this spring and planting natives in their place." But I'm stuck with a lawn because of the HOA. How much does the lawn sabotage the benefits of the garden? I'd say it doesn't. I it's it's difficult because you don't. Oh, it's not always necessary to completely take out a lawn, and it can be a, a good area for hanging out or walking on. Um, I do still have a, a bit of lawn in my front yard, but I try to keep it very floral throughout. The other parts that I can, just because I have kids and they're a very active neighborhood. Yeah. I know they trample everything, but when it comes to the grass, I would just be very, I would advocate that you mix in other plants that sort of can hide under the mower. So, okay. um, like clover, plantains, um, violets, and things like that. Okay. Um, we had a question. Um, Name of perennial native flowering plants with yellow flowers. So. Right there, um, there's um, Biden's, uh, which is like a sunflower. Those are sometimes perennial and sometimes annual. There's it's a vast family. They look like um, sunflowers, though. Um, Helianthus is. Uh, more of an annual, but will often self sow and come back. And that's also, it looks like a sunflower. Um, and um, um, there's um, evening primrose. That's always a good one. It's yellow. Uh, it's beautiful and it, it has its own moth named after it. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, and then let's see. Quickly, name your top five plants to plant around your home. <laughs> Put you on the spot. Your top five. I know it might be difficult, but we'll top five plants. Um, I would say blocks. Um, uh, I mean, honestly, I see five right here on the screen. <laughs> um, I I love scarlet bee balm. It supports so many um, butterflies and hummingbirds. Um, there's also uh, the service berry tree. I did not put in the presentation. Um, I didn't have time for it, but it's it's a beautiful tree that has um, good berries in the fall. Um, there's uh, uh, golden Alexander is a very popular one to have in your yard because it's much prettier than like the garden chervil I talked about, where it just sort of looks all uh, like like it's parsley, but it's um it's a great uh, important. One for the black swallowtail butterfly, and um, I would say mountain mint. Mountain mint is very important. Nice. Okay, and this will be the last question, and then this will be available to view um, on demand on the um, Loudoun County um, YouTube channel, the online programs YouTube channel. So if you want to reference it, feel free to watch it. It should get posted within the next week. And the last question is: I know oaks are good. Can you recommend a specific oak for a typical small town yard? large in time all oaks do um, but it's sort of just very important it can grow um, it grows a little slowly but it's throughout its life will do so much good 
Um, I just recommend it's um, three feet from the sidewalk and 12 uh, to 18 feet from the house. And it's not going to. Your sound cut out. What, what oak was it again? I think your sound cut out just at the beginning. Oh, the white oak. White. Uh, really okay. just Corcus alba. Um, it's just like the classic good um, oak. But there is the pin oak that is a little bit smaller, more manageable, um, and has a lot of important um, pollinators and gull wasps and things. Um, that's that's a tough question. I haven't had that one before. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, awesome. Well, thank you, Amy, and thank you everyone for being here today. I think if we all make a difference and put some of these native plants into our, our gardens or our lawns, we can all make a difference combined. So thank you for being here. We appreciate your time, Amy. Thank you so much.